just out of curiosity, like how much, like if the normal rent, what was the normal rent for that property? And then what would be like the actual Airbnb uh, amount that you could actually get just so that the, the viewers uh, kind of get an idea. And this is one of the reasons why I'm considering doing it as well too. I actually have the file. <laughs> so I was uh, long-term, it was rented long-term, right? So long-term rental on the property, I was making twenty uh, $2,500 a month uh -huh. on long-term rental. When I put it on Airbnb, my very first month, which which this is some of the mistakes I made, I, I, I followed what Airbnb was recommending. Uh -huh. But my first month, I made $5,277. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Jose Luis Morales. Welcome back to the Morales Group Show. Uh, this is num episode number 64. Uh, today, we got a very special guest, uh, Fernando David. Uh, he's going to teach us how to grow a successful Airbnb uh, management system and also how to grow your uh, real estate portfolio via Airbnb and increase some of that cash flow. So uh, this is an episode that I'm really excited about because I'm actually considering doing my first Airbnb rental. So welcome to the show, Fernando. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. I'm excited. Any anytime I get a chance to talk talk about real estate and Airbnb, it's a it's a great day. I I, I agree, man. I'm really excited because I know that you've got a lot of uh, experience on this, so I'm excited to share this uh, information uh, with the listeners. The only thing I want to ask from the listeners, if if you've watched some of our previous episodes and you've liked the content that we put out. Hit that subscribe button. It'll help the YouTube algorithm. So, Fernando, uh, uh, how did you stumble upon, like, let's start off by who is Fernando David? And then how did you stumble upon this Airbnb or short-term rental uh, opportunity? Uh, well, that's a, that's a deep question. Come on now, 52 years old. I can go on for hours and days with that question. But uh, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm, I'm a retired law enforcement officer. Spent 27 years. I'm a former Marine. Um, I initially, the beginning part of my youth, you know, 20s and 30s, um, I focused strictly on my W-2 job, which was my law enforcement job. Uh -huh. And I used that money and I used some of the disciplines and stuff that I learned uh, to, at the time, to uh, start building a portfolio of real estate. Mm -hmm. um, when it, uh, I tell the story all the time. One of the best things that ever happened to me was number one, joining the Marine Corps. Uh -huh. um, I know a lot of people have bad experiences, but for me, it was nothing but great experiences. Uh, and when I was in the Marine Corps, they sent me to a financial class. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm 18 years old, or I'm sorry, 19 years old. Uh, I take this class and that's all I knew about finances, but it was good because I didn't yeah, have yeah. any bad habits. Uh, yeah. And as a result of that, I was able to slowly, you know, build on a portfolio. Um, so, so, but that's about me. So what was your other question? Because I, I always get on a tangent. Yeah. The, the second one is how did you stumble like, like across like the Airbnb model or the short term uh, rental uh, model? Like, I know that you started building your real estate portfolio, but like, how did you get into it? So I got into the, the Airbnb model by accident. I, I've always, like I mentioned, since my early 20s, I've been investing in real estate. Mm -hmm. I've had uh, uh, multiple uh, rentals already, mm -hmm. but I've, I had this one particular property that I wanted to also use. And because I wanted to use it, I, ha I was looking to figure out a way to... Um, yeah, so uh, how you stumbled uh, across it. So you had this one property that you wanted to use uh as a short-term rental uh or no you wanted to use it personally but then uh yeah so i wanted to use it personally but like anything else i didn't want to lose money on it so uh -huh. i uh you know on the internet i heard about airbnb and i'm like you know what let me try it let me just see what happens mm -hmm. and we put it on airbnb got fully booked within in fact I, I hit the button and within five minutes, I had my first three reservations. Wow. And I, I told myself, oh shit, I better, get, I, I better make sure this is good because they're coming in in the next two days. Um, uh -huh. And anyways, so it, it, that went well. And then I tested it out on a duplex. 
that went well and then i went all in that's awesome so it was almost just like you want you had a property that you wanted to use as a secondary property but you didn't want to lose money on it and basically tried it and then it started uh to, to increase the cash flow just out of curiosity like how much like if the normal rent what was the normal rent for that property and then what would be like the actual airbnb uh amount that you could actually get just so that the, the viewers uh kind of get an idea and this is one of the reasons why i'm considering doing it as well too i actually have the file <laughs> so I was uh, long term, it was rented long term, right? So long term rental on the property, I was making uh, $2,500 a month uh -huh. long term rental. When I put it on Airbnb, my very first month, which which this is some of the mistakes I made, I, I, I followed what Airbnb was recommending. Uh -huh. But my first month, I made $5,277. So, doubled what i was making yeah. uh, uh in, and and those were those numbers are net numbers so it was double and that's what woke me up <laughs> that's yeah. what, that's what made me say hey you know I, there might be something here so we tested out on another on another property uh because that property I, I admit it's a very nice property pool near the beach you know i'm like you know okay Maybe this is an anomaly. Maybe it's just because of the location. Maybe this is the type of stuff I need to have. So I tested it out on a, on a duplex, uh, not near the beach, no pool, and got the same results. And I'm like, Phew. and then that's it. Yeah, that's one of the reasons I'm looking into getting into it. I mean, I've got two units very close to the beach right now. Um, and I'm just like, let's try it out. I've got nothing to lose. If I try it out, I could always turn it into a long-term rental again. If for whatever reason it, it, it didn't work. My dad also has a ranch that he, he uses as a secondary property. And, uh, I'm going to be talking to him about potentially using it whenever he wants to use it, but on the spare time, potentially, uh, turning that into an Airbnb. So it sounds like from a financial perspective, it definitely made sense. So if somebody wanted to get started in, 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 in Airbnb rentals, how does somebody go about doing that? I know that there's a couple of different models. One of them, you own the properties. And I've also heard about a model where you lease out the property, the landlord or the owner of the property knows that it's an Airbnb rental and maybe he charges a little bit of more rent but he allows you to manage that and make some money yourself as well too um are you more in favor of one of those strategies or both or have you tried one or the other or what's your opinion on that okay so the, so the uh, the second one that you're referring to we re we in the industry refer, refer to as rental arbitrage mm -hmm. so i have both but i will say this i'm not a fan of rental arbitrage okay um, it's a good way. I mean, it's good to add to your portfolio, mm -hmm. uh, but I see too many people and I see too many quote unquote gurus preach rental arbitrage all yeah. the time. And there's big holes in it, big holes. And there's a lot of risk in rental arbitrage. Uh, so I don't fully recommend it for someone to do just that, right? Mm -hmm. You should do both. Um, but if you're, if you're looking to build wealth, not just an income, if you're looking to build wealth, you need to own the property, right? Uh, we can touch that if you want, but to, to discuss both, um, uh, I, I, I recommend you do both. Now, if you want to start in the business and you don't have a lot of cash, mm -hmm. rental arbitrage is the way to go. Because obviously you're not buying the property, the entry point is less, um, and you can still make some money, especially if you're very good at negotiating your leases. If, you, if you're good at negotiating leases, you can initially uh, really do it for a very minimal cost, which is just the setup cost. Um, so, so I'll give you an example uh, of that. So okay. I, I um, did a rental arbitrage on a, in a building, an apartment, uh, where I negotiated the first two months of the lease free. Wow. Uh, which gave me two months to buy the furniture, prop it, get it up and running. And a month of that time, it gave me the opportunity to start uh, building income because the beauty about uh, uh, Airbnb is you get paid as when a, when a guest checks in, two days later, you get paid. Wow. 
So, so it's you're not at the end of the month or anything. It's not like at, that. You're at the end of the month to get a check. No, you get paid three days, uh, two to three days after the guest checks in. Your money's there. So that's good. You can start making money right off the bat, right? Uh, so in that case, I negotiated negotiated the two months free. I negotiated a three year lease, and that's why I got the two months free in the beginning. Uh, and I negotiated an out clause. So I had an out clause that after the first year, I had the choice whether to stay on the property or uh, uh, complete the next two years. So again, if you're good at negotiating, it's, it's really a good way to start because it's entry point is low. You can get some cash flow coming in and then you can start building on your next property. Um, but I, I, um, I'm a big fan of starting off with a property and, and we can touch this on later, but um, one of the easiest way besides rental arbitrage is just to house hack using Airbnb. You know, buy a property with FHA, only 3% down or 3.5% down. Uh, so it's low entry point uh, and then just rent out the rooms. Uh, that'll pay you. Plus it, it might most likely if you do it right, you live for free. And there's your first. So thing. with Airbnb, you don't necessarily have to rent out the entire house to one person. You could actually rent out like like a bedroom or two bedrooms or even three bedrooms separately, and that could be like the own unit as well, too. Yeah. Here's the beauty about Airbnb. Unlike, uh, uh, I mean, we can go into the different platforms, but Airbnb is is the most flexible. So on Airbnb, you can literally put anything with a bed. You can put on Airbnb. So like, I, I, I personally have friends that have uh, tree houses on Airbnb. Wow. Uh, yeah, uh, it's insane. Tree houses. I've seen, um, they're like tents, but they're, they're, they're more stable than a tent uh -huh. uh, on Airbnb. Wow. I've seen uh, mobile uh, trailers, uh -huh. wheels. I see all of that's been on, it's on Airbnb. You can do anything that has a bed, you can put it on Airbnb. So that's a good thing about Airbnb. Okay, that's awesome. I'm glad to, to to hear that. So eventually, if I understood correctly, the goal is to if you don't have a lot of capital, maybe start off with the rental arbitrage, get some cash flow, get some income. But the faster you can get to the owner perspective, the 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 better off you're going to 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 be. Now, in the rental arbitrage, do we tell the do people tell the landlord that they're doing an Airbnb? Like, the, is the landlord aware uh, of that? I, yes. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm speaking for myself. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely tell the landlord and definitely put that in your lease. Because uh, again, you don't want to be, you don't want to get caught off guard because if something happens, the landlord finds out you're Airbnb in it. Uh, he may try to get evict you. Um, there's a lot bad can happen if it's not in the lease. I'm a, I'm a firm believer. I don't care if it's your mother put everything in writing. Right? Now, now, Fernando, you strike me as somebody who's a good negotiator. I can tell by talking to you. How would you pitch something like that to a landlord? Like in order for him to, because I imagine landlords have concerns like, oh, like, uh, like I'd rather rent to a traditional tenant. Like what would a pitch like that look like to a landlord? So, the, I mean, there's a, I'm sure you do the same thing for me. I have to be with the person. I uh, have to, and I have to what I call vet the person to figure out what approach I'm going to take with the person. Uh -huh. But in, in general, the best way to do it is the person, if the property, um, let's say the guy wants fifteen hundred dollars for the property, right? Um, I know I'm going to make double that, so I'll go to the to the person. And I'll, I'll figure out how I'm going to alleviate his problem about that property. So problem number one, he wants a tenant. Mm -hmm. I can solve that, right? Problem number two, he wants money. I can solve that and I'll offer him more. So if it's fifteen hundred, I'll want to offer him sixteen hundred. And then it. problem number three, he wants some consistency with a tenant. I'm not going to negotiate for a one year lease. I'm going to negotiate for at least a three year lease. Uh, mm -hmm. So that solves three of his problems, and I'm going to. There's going to be certain guarantees in the lease that we will take a couple of things that I that I'm big on. I, uh, we would take care of the maintenance of the property. He doesn't have to worry about the maintenance. Now, in, in my negotiations, if I take care of the maintenance, I'm going to negotiate a lower rent. Mm -hmm. uh, so he doesn't have to, but it's a peace of mind for him. I'm not going to call him at three in the morning because the toilet's packed up. Mm -hmm. right? but, Which is a great value proposition to some landlords because they don't exactly, want that. You know? Exactly. And I try to target 
uh, which which most of the time it works with uh, mom and pop operators, right? Uh, people that, especially older people that are managing rental properties and they're living off that rental property. Those are the people that I try to target because those are the people that are easier to negotiate with because they have a greater need. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, uh, uh, for example, uh, especially down here in South Florida, same thing probably in California, you have a lot of these venture capitalists that are not getting into the, the residential business. They'll buy, you know, 30, 40 properties. Mm -hmm. I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna have a harder time negotiating with them than I am a mom and pop guy. Uh, because the, those guys are, they have, they're doing their job right, they have their SOPs, they yeah. have their systems, and if you try to deviate their system or their SOP, it's going to be very difficult. They don't, they, they, it doesn't compute for them, right? Whereas a mom and pop person, they work outside of the box. They don't work on, on normality, yeah. right? So that's that's the way to do it for rental arbitrage. Find a mom and pop operator and, and find out what their needs are and then try to fill those needs. You know, it's funny. Somebody asked me the other day, he's like, how do you sell? And I tell them, you find out what problems they're having and you come up with solutions. And that's exactly what you just described right now. You find out what the problems are. You come up with solutions for those problems and and you make it worth their while. You know, so I, I think that that was an excellent way of explaining that. So let's say somebody has the house now. This is the place where I'm at now. Um, we're going through the renovation process of the of the properties. Um, how, how do I analyze? My first questions when I was considering this is, uh, does the property have to be fully renovated in order to do the Airbnb? And then the next question is, how do I come up with how much I can make? You know, how much how, how much I can charge? And my question was, is it worth it for me? Like if my market rent is fourteen fifty for that unit, is it worth it for me to put it in Airbnb? Because my my initial thoughts were, it's a lot. I feel like it's more management intensive than just renting it out to somebody. So if you can kind of go over that, that would help me and also a lot of the viewers, because I imagine the, that's where the viewers are starting, just like I am right there. OK, so there's, a, there's there's several questions within that question. But so remind me if I forget to answer one of them. So let's let's start specifically on on setting your, your you know, your, you got your property. Yeah. And setting it up right, so you you do have to not necessarily renovate, but make sure everything's functioning properly, right? Mm -hmm. Obviously, the better looking it is, uh, yeah. the better it looks in photos, the better the more success you're going to have. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer: get it all done from day one, right? Get it all functioning right, get it fixed, get it decorated. If you don't have an eye for interior decoration, hire somebody. Uh, get that get that done. Um, and, and once it's set up to figure out what price you're gonna do, the easiest and fastest way that every rookie does is they go on Airbnb. Airbnb is gonna give you a suggestion price for the property. Mm -hmm. My recommendation is add 30% to that because they're always they're always below market. And I get it, it's a business and they do it because they want for the, they make money just like you do on but to be filled. But they don't care if you're making a, a, a profit or not. They just want to know they're going to get something from that property. And they know that if, for example, if in that neighborhood uh, uh, or in the Airbnbs around your property, if the average price is 150, they want you to be 150. Even though your property may be worth a lot more, they're going to want you to be at 150 because they. They want you all to be the same, but we're not all the same, right? Yeah. So, so you'll need to play with it. And, the, and again, it just depends on on how much money you put into it and what the property actually looks like, uh, some of the amenities you put on it. Uh, so you go up and down. And I use the example of hotels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm in Fort Lauderdale. You go to Fort Lauderdale on 17th Street. On 17th Street, you have probably about 14 different hotels mm -hmm. with 14 different prices. Right, yeah. they're not all the same. Airbnb wants you to be all the same. Uh, which, why I say, whatever price they give you, let's say they, they want at you to 30%. list it at 30 percent, and then and then adjust with you know, you're gonna have, in the beginning, you're gonna have to do a lot of playing around. Once once you've been in the business for a while, you're gonna know what, what your property demands and what you can get for your property. Uh, but in the beginning, I recommend to constantly monitor it, 
uh, there's gonna there's the platform itself has analytics. So let's say you don't have an operating software like I do, you can still do it, and I recommend you just focus on Airbnb, right? So and also depends where you're at, but Airbnb dominates the market for the majority of the world right now. Airbnb is it. So I recommend people to use Airbnb. Is it the best platform? No, I don't think it's the best platform. But it is the best, best platform for exposure. They spend the most money, it's more recognizable, the brand is, is recognizable. Uh, so you're going to get a lot more eyes on your property on Airbnb. So I recommend master the platform. There's a lot of little tricks and, and intricacies of the platform that you need to understand. The better you know it, the better you can take advantage of the, of the benefits that it provides, right? So, and I'm gonna go, um, it's, stop me if I'm getting too- Oh, no, this is good, this is good. So, the way you have to look at your listing on the platform is like an individual website, right? It operates the same. It's very similar to your, your Facebook page, very similar to your IG page, right? Uh, the, the system looks for certain characteristics to boost it, right? So I'm going to give you an example. A brand new property that gets listed on Airbnb, Airbnb is going to boost that property because they want to test you. They want to see mm -hmm. what guests want and what if guests is going to like this property. So, so for your first three weeks, you're going to be, if somebody searches for a three-bedroom in California. You're going to be at the very top. You're going to be at the top, right? After the three weeks, though, you don't get that advantage anymore. So now you have to go back to traditional SEO optimizations, right? You have to, there's certain things of, in terms of pictures, in terms of words, in terms of uh, 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 you know, anything that's searchable. It's, like bar barbecue pit, uh, pool, yes. like oh. extra bedroom or um, loft area yes. or pool table. Like those sorts of keywords are things that people are going to be searching for, in other words, basically. 100%. 100%. So I'm going to give you right now what's hot, right? And and, it, and those words change. That's why you need to stay on top of it. Um, now, we have a system that does it, but um, in the beginning, I, I stayed on top of it. So I'll give you an example right now what's hot, mm -hmm. uh, and only because of COVID, right, and all the remote work, office space. So if you have a property, I put some kind of desk. And call it office space. Wow! Like, I would. Office. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, put on your listing. Office. with office space, right? Because you have a lot of remote workers right now, and if you're in California or like me in Florida, all the people from up north are like, "I can work from home." Okay, I'm not staying here in this apartment. Let me go get some sun and work in Florida, right? Put an office, yeah. Yeah. So I. So I adjusted that. So that's one example. Of some of the key things you want to put out so you could be number one on the list. Uh, a couple of things that Airbnb likes to see. They like to see that you have instant booking. They like to see that you're pet friendly. They like to see some of, uh, so for example, uh, when you go on there, there's certain things that, that safety wise that you have to have, like smoke detectors, uh, first aid kit, fire extinguishers. If you have them in your listing, they're going to boost that, right? And then the last thing is, which comes with time, is your reviews. As long as you're getting good reviews, That'll boost it. Yeah, that boosts it. So there's a lot of little tricks that you can do to boost your listing. Uh, but going back to your original question is, once you have it set up, like I said, don't go cheap. Uh, and there's other things on furniture that I can, be, if you want me to touch on, uh, like for example, don't ever buy fabric sofa or anything fabric, like a sofa, chairs, because uh, you're going to be spending a lot of money on cleaning them. They're going to look dirty very quickly and they're going to give you a negative review because somebody, and it could be washed, but if it has a stain on it, people are like, no, that's dirty. And, uh, yeah. So, so there's little things like that. you got to avoid. Um, but great tip though. Yeah. But number one is master the platform. You need to master it. So even for us, like I, I do real estate sales as well too. And everything, I mean, from the way that we select the pictures, like meaning like we put the pictures that are likely to catch the client's attention the most at the very beginning yes. uh, how, to how many pictures we select. We select 15 to 20 pictures. Some people put 80 pictures, uh, 10 pictures of the kitchen, just different angles. 
everything from professional photography to taking pictures with your phone, at least based on what I'm seeing, I'm imagining that like some of the experienced people in, in the space understand the importance of that. And now what I'm getting is even the features and amenities, you guys uh, understand how to set it up, like maybe adding a home office now, and that'll increase the bookings and maybe even increase the amount that you guys can charge. I hear that there are platforms that can actually tell you what price to charge. And I also hear that there are platforms because to me, I mean, I sell over a hundred homes a year. I would like to set this up, but I like to set it up in the most efficient way where it allows me to do what I do best, which is to sell homes. So I, I hear that there are platforms that also change the price if there's an event in like like the Oxnard Festival down here. Can is that something that you utilize? Is that something that's available to everybody? Is that expensive? And how does that work? Yeah, there's multiple. Uh, uh, they're, they're called pricing tools. There's uh -huh. multiple. Them. The, the two most pop popular, or probably the most common, are is Airbnb uh -huh. and Price Town. Those are the two most popular pricing tools. Um, I, and I'll give you a, a, a secret. I don't use any of them um, because I my system that I have ties into and I and I kind of borrowed it from a friend who works for Marriott. It's the same system that the Marriott uses. Wow! So I use what the hotels are doing, which is to do mine. But it's very similar. It's the same system as AirDNA and the same system as Price Tab. Um, but even with those two pricing tools, which are very good, you are going to pay for them. AirDNA is the most expensive. Uh, you are going to pay for the system. But even with them, you still have to mon monitor the pricing. And I'm going to tell you why. So the system doesn't read your, your um, like how your occupancy rate is. On top of that, the system, all of them, has a tendency to do the following. So I'm going to try to do this on the whiteboard. I don't know if you're going to be able to see yeah, it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's do a whiteboard, yeah. <laughs> These are some of my properties. I, I, was, I didn't know you were going to ask me this question, otherwise I would have had to set up. But let's say you have a guest that, that's staying with you Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I can see that, huh? Okay, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And then your next guest uh, will come in on Saturday, right? So you have this gap. Most pricing software will lower the rate for this gap. Because they feel, especially if it's during the week, they feel that um, it's not going to be as uh, rent or rented as quickly as it was if it were a weekend, right? Mm -hmm. I disagree, and my experience tells me that that's very correct. It's all dependent on your occupancy. So, for example, if my entire month I'm already at ninety-five percent occupied, and I only have these two days available, and maybe another two day over here. I actually increase the daily rate for these two rates because if someone wants to come for those specific days, they only have one option, which is my two days. Because, and, and again, the system that we have, and Air, AirDNA does the same thing, it tells you what the occupancy rates for all other Airbnbs in the area. So if you know that, that this uh, Thursday, Friday, is already at 98% occupied within your county or within your area, then you're the only opportunity you have. So raise it. Because if somebody's there, if somebody has to come for those days, don't pay anything, right? Especially on, on, on weekdays. Those are usually business people. Mm -hmm. um, versus if, if there's 60% or, or uh, only 30% occupied, then I would not raise it. I would either keep it the same or go lower because you have a lot of options. That makes sense. Yeah, 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 and and that's something that like that's something that your platform would tell you. Is that something that is available to like the public, or something that you could sell to the public, or is that something that's exclusive to like people uh, to you? It's not exclusive to us because um, our operating software, which is run through Kegel, uh -huh. uh, they now implemented it. 
after right. I told them about it. So, but but as of you know, as far as I know, I think Kegel's the only uh, company that actually uses it. Uh, so they, they may be other companies that are going to start to adopt that system. Um, but as far as I know, that's the only one. The other question that I had for you is I know that we didn't really touch on any of the other short-term rental companies. What are the other short-term rental companies and can you have your listing on multiple websites or is it, can you only, if you have it on Airbnb, can you only have it on Airbnb and not another website? No, you can. So, so, um, in terms of other management companies, um, and I'm sure you probably are up on this as well. Uh, there's a lot of money being poured into short-term rentals now. Mm-hmm. A lot, like venture capitalists are going into it. And may, a lot of big companies are, are like us, we're taking advantage of all these mom and pops and buying them. So, for example, V-Trips, I don't know if you heard of that company. It's a company based out of here in Florida. Mm-hmm. They went from last year, I believe they were managing 50 units last year mm-hmm. or the year before. And they got some venture capitalist money or they got to send money for someplace. I'm, I'm going to assume it's venture capitalist and they went all in. They're currently managing 30, uh, 3000 units in Florida and Tennessee. Wow. But you're, and you're seeing a lot of companies like turnkey, um, is one of them. Um, you're seeing a lot of other, uh, uh, vacation rental uh, management companies buying up all these small mom and pops. So you're seeing a, uh, you're starting to see uh, bigger industries. So just to give you some numbers, on Airbnb, now these numbers are probably the six months old. Mm-hmm. So they could obviously they can change greatly, but over 90% of all Airbnb units on Airbnb are run by mom and pops. Right? So there's huge, huge uh, opportunity yeah, or managing companies. companies. Yeah, or managing companies, right? Big opportunities. Um, I think I mentioned this before, but when we went all in on managing, not just managing our properties, but managing other people's property, and when we created the the short term rental division of our company, um, we, in a very short amount of time, went into a we became multi million dollar business and got the award for the fastest growing short-term rental company. So thank you. Thank you. I was very happy. And I did it during the pandemic, but it happened in 2020. So, but it was because I, I still, you know, like I said before, uh, it was a gamble, but it was a gamble I was willing to take because I, I knew that people like myself, we like to travel Mm -hmm. and, Pandemic or no pandemic, when it was over and the opportunity was going to be there to, to travel, it was going to be a huge boom. And exactly what I predicted is exactly what's happening. And that we, was the time you expanded. You expanded I, during that time, which is great. I expanded that, that time. I, I, even before I had the properties, I hired two managers. I increased my cleaning staff. I bought a cleaning company um, and, and increased my maintenance staff because I'm like, I'm going to... I'm going to blow this shit up. We're, we're, awesome. we're going to go all in and, you know, thank God it worked out. And here we are. We're doing, we're doing great. We're doing, you know, I know bless, bless the Lord. Um, but, um, but yeah, so companies are getting into the game. Bigger yeah. companies are getting into the game. Even companies that I thought would never actually do it. So for example, a lot of the hotels are now in the short term rental business. Marriott's in it. In fact, Marriott has a huge, uh, short-term rental division in Europe right now. They had tested it three years ago, and I and for whatever reason it slowed down. They they weren't really promoting it, weren't really expanding. I actually apply, uh, submitted two of my properties to be part of their program um, it, here in the U.S. when it was when it because it was supposed to come in the U.S. and then they decided they weren't going to expand it. And then July of last year, boom. Marriott said, no, we're reopening it. They they doubled their, their portfolio in Europe. They're coming to the U.S. Hyatt's doing it. You're seeing it. You're seeing it. These hotels companies are expanding. Does that mean they're acquiring residential property or you mean that their hotel, they're actually turning it in? But that no, was buying property, basically. Residential properties. 
Uh, and what, what the original program with Marriott, uh, they were just like Airbnb, they were asking or, or solicitating people that wanted to be on the program. And you would, like I did, I applied and I submitted my property to Marriott. Um, and, you know, they sent, they sent uh, a person out, just like the Airbnb Plus. I don't know if you know that, about that. Yeah. Airbnb has a, it's called Airbnb Plus, and it's for higher end luxury homes. Um, so, but to get on that program, you have to apply. So, uh, Marriott did the same thing. They were, they were having people apply because they were going to test the market. It went well. Now they're buying the, the residential properties and converting them. Um, That's great. Yeah. That's good. So, it's just like almost like, like uh, if you see that happening, there's a huge market for it. And the people who own property, I mean, they can capitalize on it. I wanted to ask you this because I'm considering another property to buy in a very luxurious neighborhood that I can acquire with very minimal down payment. The only thing is that it has an HOA. And like, I'm a little bit skeptical because of that. I'm, I'm looking into the CC and R's at the moment. So I wanted to ask you, can any property be Airbnb or does it vary by city? Does it vary by HOAs? And can you elaborate a little bit on that? And if there's any mistakes that you or any of your students have done, if you can elaborate on that, that would be helpful. And just so you know, I always ask like three questions at a time. Well, I'm I'm no. <laughs> <laughs> no problem, no problem. All right. So, so the question about HOAs, I don't buy an HOAs. Okay. Even if the HOA allows you to do short-term rentals, I don't buy into it because the, as you know, the power goes to the HOA. Yeah. And they can change that at any time. At right? any given time. So they can change. So I don't do that. Um, um, again, it, it's personal preference. Uh, I try to minimize my risk. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to be on an HOA. Um, Especially yeah. like, let's say that there's 10 Airbnb rentals in an HOA and then the Airbnb, the, 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 the HOA bans it. Now you've got 10 sell 10 owners that were relying on that income that now maybe they have to sell all at the same time. And now basically you might be taking a haircut on that property if you buy an HOA. hundred percent, hundred percent. So that's why I don't do that. Um, I don't buy an HOA. Um, so now remind me what your other question was. So the, the other question was uh, if, if there are restrictions by the city and I'm, okay. I'm asking you this cause I'm looking into my market now. And I know that one of the cities has restrictions on apartment complexes. They have restrictions in a certain area. So I wanted to kind of get your feeling on that. So um, I can only speak for Florida because I don't uh, go to other places. Now I do go to conferences and I have talked to other people. Uh, regulation is a problem in some cities. Uh, in California specifically, it's um, what's it, Bear Mountain or Bear, what's it called? In, uh, uh, Big, in Bear. The Big, Big Bear. Big Bear, yeah. Big Bear has, uh, there's, only in their regulation, only a certain amount of homes can be on Airbnb. Really? So they capped it. Yeah. Now there's a lawsuit, and they're probably the lawsuit's probably going to win. So, so I'll give you an example here in Florida. And again, this is where most of my experience is. The city of Miami Beach at one point banned uh, vacation rentals; could not have Airbnb. Well, residents of, of of Miami Beach sued and won because you can't ban it. So. Florida now has a law that states you cannot restrict someone from doing uh, what they want to do with their property, basically. Correct. Correct. Now, what they can do and what some cities do do, and this is another thing in legis legislation that's looking to be changed, although I don't know if I'm in favor of it, mm -hmm. is that um, cities can regulate it and they can put whatever restrictions or regulations they want as long as it doesn't restrict the owner from actually renting it. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example, because it varies from city. Hollywood, the city of Hollywood is in Florida is probably the more, the most, or has the most requirements. And I don't think any of the requirements are unreasonable. I don't think they're, they're obstacles, yeah. um, they're just extra steps. So I'll give you an example of the most common stuff that they require. Uh, and even if the regulation wasn't there, I would still have these things, right? They require smoke detectors in every room, they're required if, if it's a if it's a one story you only need one fire extinguisher but if it's two story you need two or three stories you need three uh it's one fire extinguisher per story um some cities require a evacuation map to be placed 
on on the doors. Uh, City of Hollywood uh, requires that you have an exit sign on the front door and the back door. Um, so stuff like that is required to, by the city. And the city requires, or county, or state requires that you get a license. Now, the license, uh, uh, for example, the city of Fort Lauderdale, city of Hollywood, city of Pompano, it's just a city uh, business license uh, that you need to get. Uh, very inexpensive, doesn't, again, doesn't require much. Uh, I'm actually in favor of uh, limited regulation. I want to say limited. Uh, and the reason I'm in favor, in favor of those things is because it, it creates, um, it becomes an industry. Yeah, it creates it, 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 and professionalizes the industry. Right. Well, now, wait, if I have a tent, does that mean I have to have a fire extinguisher if I'm running out one of those tents? I'm kidding. Yeah, no, but yeah, and in Florida, you can't do that. So it doesn't apply in Florida. That, that doesn't apply in Florida. Uh, yeah. but, but it standardizes that. So because I've been doing this for a long time, have oh. not had, knock on wood, uh, any major incidents on any of my properties. But, and it's very, it's very uncommon to have a it major happen. Yeah. But it happens. I mean, look what happened in, in Oakland or San Francisco uh, in the Halloween, Halloween party, right? But I've always said we in the industry are the ones at fault, not, not the city officials, not your neighbor, you, because you control the property. You need to make sure that you govern your property accordingly. Uh, so make sure nobody's throwing a party. Make sure you you know you have to supervise your property. Just just listing it on Airbnb and hoping everything's going to be fine. It's not going to cut it. How do you do that? Like, how do you make sure somebody doesn't have a, a party? Or how? I mean, I, obviously you can't prevent prevent it 100 percent but how do you reduce the chances of that happening? Because that's one of my concerns. Like, I have an 11 unit apartment, and there's nine other tenants. I'm going to be doing two Airbnbs. How do I make sure of that, or like, how do I reduce that? Okay, so there's there's uh, some very easy ways to do it. Um, and then there's some other ways to do it that's even better, but takes more work, right? First, first two things, very easy, install cameras. Not on the interior, on the exterior of the property. Cameras to see who's coming in and who's coming out. Sure. Uh, and then the biggest one, install noise detectors in your property. So all my properties have noise detectors and it's set at a certain decibel and the moment the uh, uh, the decibel go above what I set it at. It sends me a, a notification. It sends a notification to the guest, and then after thirty minutes, if it continues, it starts. It's an alarm. It goes off. Wow, uh, that's a gold nugget right there. Uh, so, and I get notified, and then I send my my with. So, so here's how that works, and and I, I love it. It's probably the best tool out there. I, so, it's crazy. Yeah, so it, it, it notifies you immediately when it goes up, right? Uh -huh. let's, say the, let's say somebody's throwing a party. As soon as they throw it, you get a notification that the decibels are up. Um, as soon as I get that notification, uh, the system sends an, a message to the guest. To the right. Automatic. Yeah, automatic. Says the guest, hey, your, your noise is above our, our limit. 15 minutes later, if it's still going off, I get notified again. The guest gets another text message, plus they're both text and emails, right? Uh, another text message saying that it's been 15 minutes, failure to lower the noise will result in, in being evicted. So in that 30 minute mark, the, the alarm goes off. And the alarm doesn't go off until I reset it. It, st it stays on until I reset it. So now I when you say you reset it this is one of the things that i'm talking about like do you have somebody in place that, oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that? No, it's not no. you physically at two in the morning being like man these college kids are throwing a party let me reset it because that's one of the yeah. concerns yeah yeah so for you so like like here's my recommendation anyone not just for you but Set up systems and people to run the systems for you basically 100 percent, 100 percent, or even easier even easier is hire a company like me, right? Let them do all that crap. Let them worry about all that and you just collect the paycheck. Because at the end of the day, it's it's just like a regular landlord who hires a management company to do the work. Um, you're you're still gonna make enough money to be profitable and to have- Without having to deal with it personally, basically. Right, 
You're right. going to increase your cash flow um, and you're not going to have to deal with it personally. Now, let me ask you this. I had heard, and this is, I asked somebody about the noise complaint because that was one of our concerns. Um, and this is the best thing I've, I've ever heard about it. He said, charge a penalty if it, it like charge a fee, if they do that, like not only are, are is the alarm going to go off, but if you make the alarm go off, there's going to be a, a $250 penalty. Is that something that you guys implement? And that leads to my next question about additional sources of income than just the daily rate and how that kind of plays a factor in the, in pricing of your property. Uh, so First okay. question about the so, fee for the noise and then so the, the so the fee for the noise you have two options I don't charge a fee for the noise I just kick you out if you if you don't if you don't follow the rules you got three chances you get kicked out so um, that same night or the next day or? Night, I fucking go there and I sorry about that I go there and you're out right and I've luckily I've only had to do that twice um but. But yeah, you're out. And in Florida, this is why another reason why it's very important that you have that license, because each each state has their own landlord tenant rules. But when you are a vacation rental property, and this is I'm I'm talking just about Florida because I don't know other states. In Florida, and this is why I want the this is why I tell people all the time, get the license, because you don't longer abide or fall under the landlord tenant. You fall under hotel motel. So you can kick anybody out of your business because it's your business uh, for any reason. You know, you don't have to go to the court, get an eviction, none of, none of that. No, if they're a guest at your place and you have a license, you can call the police and say, hey, these person, for, you don't even have to give a reason, but I always tell them, hey, they violated the rules, I need them out and show them the, the, your license and they kick them out. Uh, again, I've been doing this a long time. I only had to do that twice. That's actually better than the penalty because it, it, it keeps people from just, oh, I'll just pay the $250 yeah. penalty and I'll continue partying all night long yes. and without any disregard to the neighbors yes. or any disregard to any anybody else. You know, Can you put those noise things on the outside as well too? Like, if, for example, if you have a house with a backyard or um, – I, I, I don't do that. No, you'll get a lot of uh, – um, so – the noise thing, it's, there's, right, as of right now, at least the systems we have operate 24 seven. So like my properties with pool, if I put them on the outside, they'll be going off during the day because people are outside in the pool, they're barbecuing. I don't care if they're making noise during the day. It's only at night that I need the noise level to be down because that's what the, the city ordinance states from 10 PM to 6 AM, no noise. So that's when we do it. Uh, so, and I agree with you 100%. I, I don't put a fee because they're like, okay, I'll pay it and they'll keep part of it, right? Yeah. And so, then it defeats the purpose. It the defeats purpose. the purpose, right. So that's that. Now, in terms of additional revenue, there's lots of way to get additional revenues on Airbnb. I rent bikes. I rent beach chairs. I rent umbrellas. I rent tours. I, I, I team up with restaurants. I get a commissions on if somebody goes and uses our coupon at that restaurant. There's wow. More than less. There's so much, so many ways to up. And I don't even call it upselling because a lot of it's not an upsell. But there's so many different ways to make extra money in addition to the fee. So another, so within the fees, right? A couple of things that we do as well is, um, um, and, and it's minimal, but it adds up when you have as many properties as we have. Like we charge two dollars for a linen fee. Um, um, extra guests so of a property you could only have so, so the way the law here is in terms of occupancy if you you could only have two people per room or two adults per room and two additional persons for like a sofa bed or a mattress so in a three-bedroom house the most you can have is eight people but what I do is the first six no extra charge. But if you want the seven and eight, I'm charging you an extra for those additional guests because it's causing us to bring out a, a rollaway bed or extra linen for the, for the seat for sofa. Uh, so we charge extra for those. So that, those are other streams of revenue. We charge, we, we're all of, not all, but the properties that our insurance allows us to, we're pet friendly and we charge for pets. Um, 
And actually, let me take that back. I don't charge for the pat because I learned my lesson. I charge for extra cleaning fee. Because if you charge for a pat and they come back and say, oh, I'm a service dog, I got a service level, you can't charge. But I can charge you extra to clean the property. Because of the pet, basically. Okay, yeah. so there's just basically multiple ways of adding additional income on top of the regular Airbnb uh, rental, which could be increase the profit or the bottom line on the on the property. Just out of curiosity, um, I know that you referred to a management company maybe managing the property because for somebody like me, I hear all the, the services and I think time as well too. How much does it cost to hire? Uh, like, what's the industry like uh, uh, cost to hire like a management company to manage the entire uh, uh, property for you? Uh, it, it varies by location, but I know we're between twenty and thirty percent of the gross revenue. Okay. Uh, let, me, let me take it back. Uh, twenty to thirty percent of the gross uh, daily rate revenue. So, so like the extra stuff, some companies don't charge you for the extra stuff, mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, but but definitely the daily rate. So, so the daily rate is a hundred dollars. Thirty dollars goes to the management company. So it's a great profit center, even for the management company as well, too, right? Huge for me. The management. So when I first started, I only did my own properties, right? Um, and and I was doing great. On the management side, it's big <laughs> because you can. So just imagine it's scalable, it's scalable as well, too. Very Super scalable. scalable. That's that's Very. the beauty. That's, listen, the beauty about the management side is is you don't necessarily like me. I'm, we're expanding out more like V traps or V trips. V trips are really doing it phenomenal. I think the the uh, Milo is the last thing. I think his first name is Stephen. Stephen Milo is the CEO of, of V trips. Um, that guy has, I mean, he's on another another planet right now. Uh, and, and the revenues are insane. So his EBITDA, because we he, he posted this uh, recently, before the last six months, his company, and I, I told you, he was only managing like 30 properties. Uh, his EBITDA was, was a little under a million. Now his EBITDA is $55 million. Wow. Tell, Plus, tell, tell people what EBITDA is. I, I know what it is, but just tell, tell them what, what it is. It's just a, um, an evaluation. Before, earning before taxes. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's the simplest form is used to evaluate your company, what your company's worth, what you can sell your company for. It's that system. Um, uh, earning uh, taxes and all that stuff that's on there. But anyways, in terms of management, and the management company now it is work don't, don't get me wrong but if you have systems in place and and you're operating your company as you should be mm -hmm. um the profit margins are great so let me ask you this we talked about some of the systems we talked about air dna uh you we talked about uh virgo or what was that other platform that you, you or not the other platform kigo kigo or Kigo is operating software. Now, there's many. So, so you have companies like Streamline, uh, Kigo. Kigo and Streamline are, are all incumbents uh, websites. You have, uh, uh, what's the other one that's really popular? Air, uh, no, uh, b, b is one. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot of operating softwares out there that you can use. Uh, depending on how big your, your, your system is, I highly recommend just go with a company like Kegel that will customize the system for you. So like our system is, we, custom. we trust, yeah, it's custom. Uh, we started with Streamline, uh, but but the bigger we got, we realized we needed something more customized, so we switched. Um, but it's, as you know, systems are it. You gotta have systems, you gotta have SOPs, uh, and you have to have a very strong team. It's a business. Uh, and then for our viewers, a standard operating procedures, SOPs, that's what that means. And it basically just means how you handle certain situations when they happen, how what how things are designed. They're basically like the operations manual, basically. Right. Now, I wanted to ask you this for I know for my real estate company, there are certain people that we have to put in certain roles in order for the company to run uh, per, uh, to run uh, to its highest capacity. What are the different people in place that you're going to need to run a small Airbnb? And then maybe if you can go as as they, if someone wanted to get to your level as well too, like a management company, 
like I know that they're going to need a cleaning lady. What other people would be crucial in running an Airbnb business um, and even running a management company if they eventually wanted to go in that direction? You hit the two most important people, right? You need a, a cleaning staff, whether it's one person, if you have one property or not. I, I, I recommend when you're starting out to contract that out. Get a company that specializes in short-term short rental. Term. Yeah, because the other mistake that I see a lot of people make is that they'll just hire a cleaning person. Well, mm. cleaning person, there's, there's a big difference be between someone going to your house and just clean it when you live in it or someone doing an actual turn over way different uh standards are different um like for us we want our our towels full a certain way we want the bed made a certain way it's all about presentation when yes. you have a cleaning person all they're doing is cleaning and dusting they don't care about presentation for us don't care if the pillow is full off yes. in a certain angle right exactly so so that's first right the cleaning person or cleaning team the most critical component of your business by far the most important that's that's what you should spend the most time and money on is getting a good solid cleaning team in place number two maintenance right you gotta have if a toilet goes bad you don't have three weeks to call a plumber you gotta yeah. go get that done yeah you gotta get that done so maintenance is a second now that means you gotta get it done that same night if the toilet goes out at, at like 12 o'clock or no so so like for us and every guest gets this information we don't operate from 10 p.m to 6 in the morning something unless the house is burning down we're not responding we're not responding so um so those, that's the time frame if a toilet goes bad uh at 8 p.m my guy's going out there you know it goes bad uh, or if i get a a work order because the guests can send us a work order we get the work order uh, next morning, when my team comes into the office, they get it and they go out. But it has to, it's, it's not something you can you know wait days for. You got to get that done. Mm -hmm. and, and the quicker you do it, the better the customer is going to feel. And, and the better the reviews as well, That's too, it. which That's is it. important. The review aspect is important. Yeah. Here's here's another thing that a lot of people don't realize. Um, and and I is you're going to get. And again, the more properties you have, the more inquiries. But I literally get thousands of inquiries per month, right? So our software has automatic messaging. So if an inquiry comes in, it'll it'll decipher what it is, and, and if it's a standard question, they'll answer it. If it's something that needs to be answered by one of our staff, then it goes to the staff. So like it's like, oh, does your unit allow for pets? Yes, our unit allows for pets. Thank you so much for inquiring. Let us yeah. know if you have any additional questions. Correct. So it's 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 that, and and that's hugely important uh, as you start to scale. In the beginning, you could probably do it yourself, like I did it myself. My first five properties, I did everything myself. Uh, I organized everything. I sent the you know my cleaning staff, maintenance. I did everything myself. My first five five properties. After that, I realized shit. I spent a lot of time on the stupid phone. Uh, that I could be spending growing the business. So then I hired a manager uh, and then we found out about the automation and then we got the automation. Which is awesome. That's yeah. great. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, now, are there any tips for the reviews? Like I know, like I would imagine that the reviews are extremely important. What I mean by that is that obviously as a host, the person booking is your your guest and he's your customer and without the customer your business can't run meaning the higher the reviews the more likely other people are to book your property and the lower the reviews the less likely somebody may be or if it's 50 50 do i book this property or that property they might book this one therefore they have higher occupancy how important is the review process and are there any tips and tricks that you use to get better reviews besides providing excellent customer service yeah, so uh, answer your first question, all the platforms, but specifically Airbnb, is heavily review driven. So for example, uh, booking.com, VRBO, the, the, the system is not affected by the reviews. The only thing that's affected is the guest. You know, the guest, like you mentioned, you're in your scenario, if you have two properties to pick from, uh, they'll look at the reviews and they'll pick the one with better reviews, but it doesn't affect your SEO. 
and Airbnb it does. So Airbnb is really critical. So and this, the the vacation rental business is heavily dependent on reviews. So that's that that the answer to that question. Tricks on how to get higher and better reviews besides providing excellent service is the following. We when a guest when a guest checks out that that morning they get a message and that message states you know thank you that uh, this is a reminder check out is at 11 we really appreciate having you uh it's something to this effect we really appreciate having you we will give you we will review you and give you a five star we hope we earn the same wow that's great verbiage yeah yeah so uh does it, does it matter uh, th now, th uh, does a review for a consumer matter as much too? Like, if they were a, like, if I was a good guest, is that important? Like, can you deny requests? Like, if I have a one star review, like this guy goes over and throws a party every single time, and then people will not rent to me at that point, I would imagine, right? Hundred percent. You, they have the same review process as you. The whole review system, That's and right. and this is why I love it because, and this is why I send that message is because psychology you know it's a psychological play right they know i'm going to review them they know that i'm i already stated i'm giving you five stars so in their mind they're going to feel obligated to do the same and they'll give you the five stars yeah well, uh, it, it, yeah it's awesome yeah and the other thing that we 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 emphasize is this the stars because what's screwed up about the review process of airbnb it doesn't matter what they write what matters are the stars, stars. Yeah. They could say he's excellent, great, fantastic, but if they put three stars, that's the thing that matters. That's what matters. That screws you up. And I let them know that because a lot of people don't know that. And I let them know in that message uh, 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 what what's important for our system and our business is the stars, not what you write. Because so, I I want them to put the stars. I can care less what they're right. They don't have. They, they could write one sentence, and as long yeah. as they have five stars, it'll be great. Here's the other thing. Did you ever answer about the multiple platforms at all? Like, can oh, yes. I have it on Airbnb and VRBO? And if so, how do I prevent double bookings if I have it on multiple platforms? So you can have it as many platforms as you want, uh -huh. but you have to sync all the calendars. So our software syncs the calendars, all of them, but the platforms do the same. Okay. So, if you, so if you're on Airbnb and on VRBO, you can take you can take the, the calendar from either and sync them. So that you don't have double bookings double happen, book basically yeah. at one time. Cause that was my concern. I, there's a benefit to having more exposure cause that'll mean you've got more eyes on your property, but then the double booking thing was, so they sync basically. It's a, listen, a double booking is taboo. What does that mean? It means if you have a double booking and you have to cancel a reservation because oh. the property is available, you can a Airbnb penalizes you, but B it drops you down for a few days in SEO. Wow. Okay, yeah. so hey, that's really important. And does that happen if you sync the calendars, or does that not? No. Happen? If the calendars, if the calendars are synced properly, uh, properly, you you won't, you won't get a double booking. But let's assume that there's a glitch in the system and you do get a double booking. Oh. If, if they're synced, you call Airbnb or vice versa, VRBO. They'll look at your system. They see that it's done, and then they won't penalize you. They'll take care of the guest because it was their mistake, basically. It was their mistake, and this is and that's a and and we haven't touched on this, but Air, they all have a resolution desk. Airbnb, VRB, all these companies uh, have a a a what what's called a resolution desk. So, for example, you have an issue with a guest. A guest, a guest doesn't want to check out on time. Uh, a check, a guest broke furniture or something um you can get reimbursed if the guest refuses to pay by the platform but but and this is why i said you need to understand the platform and master it because each one has their own independent review process and certain specific items that need to be on that and that uh initial application for reimbursement mm -hmm. or otherwise you lose it um, I won't go into it because there's a lot of details into it, but the first thing you should learn is how does the resolution process works? Because at some point you may need that. Like a guest is going to break a chair, 
right? Yeah, big time, yeah. So they'll break a chair and they won't do it on purpose, you know, especially if you don't set your property up right, something's going to break um, and you're going to want reimbursement. So I, I usually get it from the actual platform itself because they do have host guarantees. If the guests won't pay, then the platform is going to pay. Uh, or I take it off the deposit, right? There's, there is a deposit, but that deposit works the same way as the resolution does. So you have to ask Airbnb to get that deposit and you have to prove that it was the fault of the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Now, um, is there a way to sponsor your ad, your 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 thing to show up at the top, or is that it's more to focus on the SEO and the five star rating and learning how the back end of the system works? That way, you show up organically a little bit more. Okay. Now, let's talk about this. This is and this will be the last thing that we talk about. Like, what are the, some of the most common problems? Like, 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 what are the some of the most challenging things that you've had to overcome uh, with the Airbnb? Like, is it like? Uh, um, the met delegating the messages was it uh people checking out late um is it uh people breaking things is it the party thing what, what would you say is uh, is a most common or what's the i'm imagining you don't experience it as much anymore but what are the the for a beginner what are the most common things and and maybe how would you solve that because i'm imagining you've already troubleshooted through a lot of the issues so that it's more of like a well-oiled machine yeah, so um, probably the biggest uh, biggest problem, and it's uh, people smoking weed or marijuana in your in your unit, because it's a strong order and it stays in the unit. It's probably the only real problem. Everything else is very rare, but what's really common is that. So we we even even though we and then this goes to the example of why I don't charge a penalty when they throw a party. Uh, because we do charge a penalty if they smoke weed, but they still do it. They just pay the penalty, right? But um, but you have to have an ozone machine because that's the only thing that really takes the order out. Because you don't want so. For example, if you have a checkout at eleven and a check in at four, you don't want you your want, thing smelling like freaking. Yeah, exactly. So what we do if my my housekeepers go in and it smells like like a strong odor of weed. We initiate the, the machine, put, leave it on for an hour. It doesn't eliminate it all within the hour because usually it takes 12 hours, but it'll start the process. And then we, our cleaning people have, um, um, it's, it's like Febreze, but it's commercial to take out order. And we, we spray it all over the place. And 99% of the time, it does a phenomenal job. So that's it. The biggest problem is that, is, is dealing with, What's a typical penalty for something like that? So we charge we charge one hundred and fifty dollars for that. And it's a hef I mean, it's a profit center as well too. I mean, if you get ten people doing it, that's an extra fifteen hundred dollars in the month. Yeah. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna give you how profitable that is, right? So the first time it happened to me, I had I didn't know anything about the clean about ozone. I had to get rid of it basically. Yeah, I had to get rid of it. Ozone machine or anything yeah. like that. Didn't know about that, right? So it happened to me. I called the cleaning because at that time I didn't own the cleaning company. I called the company. I actually, the company that I owned actually was the one that I contracted originally. I bought them out. But I called them up. I said, hey, we got a serious problem. You know, how do we deal with it? And they're the ones that tell me, well, do you have an ozone machine? And I said, no. And I said, well, if you can get one, we can solve the problem. So I went to Amazon, found one. Uh, bought it. Are they expensive? Uh, they're ex they're a little pricey. They're about seven hundred dollars. A good one. So I bought it, filed a claim with Airbnb, and got the money back. So now I got the ozone machine for free, and now I use the ozone machine whenever I need to use it because now I have yeah, it. That's a, that's a that's a great return on investment. Hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah. I did one hundred fifty bucks. A thousand a thousand percent ROI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so that that's how we learn about. But if you learn through mistakes, right? So that's a problem. We don't have problems with people not checking out on time because we're very pretty good with that. So we rarely have that issue. You, you. So another big one um, when starting out is is dealing with staff, right? Um, this is why I say your clean staff is extremely important. Um, 
when I first started, I used friends and families to go clean the units, right? And I would pay them. Uh, but quickly found out, A, they're not doing a great job, and B, a lot of times I'm hounding them, hey, you were supposed to be there. I got a guest coming in in two hours, right? So from right from the get-go, either create your own staff or hire a cleaning company so that you if you never run the issue of the guest showing up and the property's not clean. Yeah, that would be horrible. Oh, that's the, that's the worst. Uh, but like I said, knock on wood has not happened to me, but that's my, when I first started, that used to be my biggest fear. I would always be so stressed out and calling, did you get to the house yet? Did you clean it yet? I got guests coming. Are you? Well, thank God I don't have to deal with that anymore. One of my buddies who has an Airbnb told me, look, one of the problems is the marijuana. And the other problem is that the guests leave sex objects everywhere. There's bags of them at times. You know, <laughs> but here's here's what that comes from. He may not know this. I don't know if he knows this. He may not know what I'm about to tell you. And this is why you got to be very careful with your rules. And this is why I have cameras. Uh -huh. There's there is a and it's part of the porn industry. They use Airbnbs to film their porn. Oh, so that's why there's sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, he said that he found a bag of them. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I'll, I'll tell you a funny story. <laughs> no, this is a good story. So we get we get a reservation on one of our properties. Now, it's it's camera, and and the person who rented it, I can see in the reviews that they've rented multiple times. Uh, no, nothing negative, but on all of them, every time they write in the review, that there's always been something like uh, uh, foot traffic, foot traffic, foot traffic, right? So I, before, so one of the ways to mitigate problems too is once you get the reservation, they get all the rules, they have to sign that they read the rules. But what you should do is also call the phone number and make sure that the phone number on the reservation is the person on the other line. Because a lot of time what happens is you'll get uh, a person will book it for somebody else. And that person won't be the one showing up. It's a completely different group. A lot of times is parents renting for their kids because we have a minimum age. Uh, so I like to call and and get a, 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 a human being on the other line. Yeah. Nah, human being on the other line and then ascertain who's going to be there, who's not going to be there, and all that stuff gets done, right? So this particular case, uh, I call the guy. Guy answers, yeah, no problem, everything's good. They get to the house, and I looked on the camera, and like it's that house occupied eight people. I only see eight women go into the house. So I'm like, okay. Uh, <laughs> so I tell I tell my staff, hey, hey, just you know, if you keep hear it, yeah, keep an eye, see what's going on. Don't hear anything. Uh, everything's calm. Everything was good. No issues. The, the morning of of the checkout, we sent that message out. We get a phone call from the phone number, which is the guy that rented it. Get the phone call. The guy goes, hey, I uh, just got your message. I'm in the hospital. Um, I don't know what happened or what's going on, but I'm not at the property. So I tell my cleaning staff, I said, hey, get your ass over there now because this guy's not at the property. And I still see in the cameras and nobody left. The cleaning staff knocks on the door. Turns out it was a transvestite, a group of transvestites that came in, uh, filming whatever they were filming, and they freaking drugged this guy to, and used the property while this guy was whatever they gave this guy, sent him to the hospital. Wow. Took his wallet, took his car. <laughs> I'm like, what the luckily they did nothing to the property. Uh, they just use it to film and, and take money from this guy. It was That's insane. crazy. That's <laughs> crazy. So we're going to end it at that. Um, is there anything else that you think we should add or anything that else that would add value? And then the last part is uh, where can people find you after that? Um, no, I think we pretty much covered everything. I mean, we covered a lot. Yeah. Um, I, I know a lot of it was general. Um, if anybody has any specific question, you're welcome to email me or DM me. 
on my Instagram. I, I think you're going to have the Instagram. Yeah, we'll have it on the, uh, on yeah. the top, bottom of the video. Have it on there. Uh, Instagram is the fastest way to get a hold of me or via my YouTube channel or on uh, our email. Okay. And we'll, uh, yeah, we'll have your uh, Instagram and we'll have all the links below. So I wanted to say thank you uh, for being a guest. I learned a lot. I had a great time with you, obviously. Uh, you're somebody that really knows their stuff. So I appreciate that. I, I know I'll be reaching out to you as we go through the process of setting up our uh, Airbnbs. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody. This was episode number 64 of the Morales Group Show. Uh, if you've enjoyed our content, make sure to hit that subscribe button, hit that like button, and also hit that share button. Uh, thanks so much, Fernando. Anything else? Uh, pretty much it. Thank you so much, guys. All right, thank you. Have a good one.